Okay. Well, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the Torah portion, and just ask that you be with us and guide us and open our hearts and our eyes and our ears to your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. So I just got a quick little thing I'm going to do, and then I want to, the goal is to provoke some thought. And so we're in Exodus 19. I see y'all left. And here's the question. What is God's purpose for us? Um, what's his purpose? It, it's really simple, I think. Um, I don't think it's just for salvation and that. I think it's that we need to know him, that we need to experience him, and we need to share him with others. And there's an old saying, to know him and to make him known. And I think that fits. So you all agree with that? that? That makes sense? And so in the midst of our journeys, um, there's, we have these mountaintop moments, these mountaintop experience, and that's where we kind of come to something. It's a challenge, a life challenge, and here's this mountain, and we struggle with it, and we struggle with it, and we struggle, and slowly, 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 we finally reach the top. And when we get there, we, we experience this like this love and joy and peace in the presence of God. And I thought about that when we were talking about Mount Sinai. They, you know, they go through all this stuff, you know, years of slavery and all this crazy stuff going through the seas parting and across the desert and the Amalekites and then you, boom, and you end up at a mountain. <laughs> um, but mountains tend to be turning points. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, the, the flood with Noah's Ark, it lands where on the mountains of Ararat, like that's a turning point. Things change, you know, it's a new world. Um, Abraham, God calls him up, offer your son, your only son, Isaac. That had to be an interesting walk, although it seemed like Abraham had so much faith. He was just like, okay, here's what we're going to do. You know, he just had faith in God. And it made, it made that challenge easier. Um, and then when he gets there, Yahweh provides this ram, this, sac this uh, substitute sacrifice. You know, and of course, that's a picture of Yeshua who dies for our sins instead of us. Elijah goes up on Mount Carmel and, you know, challenges the prophets of Baal. And we have to challenge and defeat the lies of the world today and, and rise above that and go up on that mountain of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And Yeshua himself, you know, he goes up on the mountain with his disciples, uh, James, John, and Peter. And, he's, he's, and they see him like they've never seen him as a, as a, as a being of light. And then here in Exodus 19, the Bible story, Moses takes us along to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And it's really chapter 19 is about preparing us for chapter 20. But chapter 19 is real easy to skip because we want to just read the Ten Commandments, right? And, but they had this experience. They went there. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if you've ever had one of those mountaintop experiences with God and how that affected your walk later on. Um, you know, some, they're not always mountains because we live in kind of a flat area. Some of them are valley or treetop experiences or, you know, in a tunnel experience. But you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a mountain experience. And the thought was, were you ready for that? Um, it seemed like this is about Chapter 19 is like encouraging us to be ready. It seemed like most of the time when I've had something like that happen or talked to other people, they weren't quite ready for it. And I don't think anybody was ready for what happened at Mount Sinai. They, just, they thought they were ready, but they weren't really ready. Um, we can't really expect to encounter God necessarily unless we are prepared for it. It would come out a lot better if we have some preparation. We're never going to be completely prepared but sometimes, you know, the thing that we, ha that we run into, we can't get there. You know, Israel, for example, you know, ran into uh, this, you know, sea that they couldn't cross. But then God made a way. And then they find this, as soon as they get on the other side, they have this enemy that meets them. But God made a way. And he just kind of prepared them as they went. But... If you've 
encountered a mountain that you've been climbing for a long time and you can't get up it and you can't get over it, just want to encourage you that there's a way. Just prepare to meet God because sometimes, you know, the ones we can't cross is, is the ones where he's really going to help us. I'm, and I'm just thinking about in one of my most difficult times, I realize I'm standing at the base of a mountain. Okay? And one did I just of myself, I was like, I can't do this. I can't climb this. And the Lord gave me a verse. Um, it was Mark 12. It starts in 22, and Yeshua says, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He will have whatsoever he saith. And I didn't know exactly, I knew that wasn't a name it and claim it thing, but I heard this like, yeah, this is a mountain, but you can, you, can, you can do it. You can do it with me. You can't do it by yourself. And as I stared at the mountain, I took a step. And pretty soon, I kept taking steps. I kept clawing. I kept moving. Just kept moving. Kept looking forward, not looking back. And a weird thing happened. I kept looking up, and the mountain got lower. And the lower it got, the, the more reasonable it looked. And so that encouraged me. So I kept going and I kept going. And what I didn't realize is the mountain really hadn't changed, but my perspective was changing as I was going forward. This part of the journey we were talking about. And so the thing that looked impossible is like, well, I'm halfway there. And when I knew that I was halfway there, I said, you know what? I, I, I might can do this. And just, you know, kept, kept doing that. And then one day, I was, thought it was, I was probably pretty close to the top. And I heard this voice, this mountain-shaking voice. And my world changed. But if I hadn't gone through that struggle, it wouldn't have happened. If I hadn't kept trusting him, like, I can't do it, but he can. I can do all things through God who strengthens me, through Messiah who strengthens me. Okay. If we look at this section of Scripture in Exodus 1 through 18, he basically is showing us the way of salvation, right? And how the world or Egypt turns against the people of God. And that results, ultimately, what's interesting is as the world turns against us and as Egypt turned against Israel, where does Israel turn? We turn to God. When we face this mountain, whatever it might look like, where can we turn? It's when there's no right place left to go, we look up. We should have looked up to begin with, but sometimes we wait until we're fa facing this insurmountable mountain. But then in chapter 19, it starts this new thing. It's like this whole struggle from Exodus 1 through 18 is about getting into slavery and, you know, just all the whole thing that happened there. And so we're about to you know, not just meet his power over the world, God's power over the world and the ability to part the sea, but we're, when you meet him at Mount Sinai, we, all of a sudden we're talking about his holiness, his holiness and power and his empowering us to overcome sin. And that's what prepares us to meet him on the mountain because it talks about, you know, it, you, at the base of Mount Sinai, cleanse yourself, set yourself apart. What's that all about? That's so he can take us to a new level. That's what that's all about. I want you all to look at how do you apply this to your life. You stand and say, don't, you know, you're always saying, you know, you go tell him, Moses, you go tell him. <clears throat> but did you notice that he says, now tell the priest to come up the mountain. Those who had set themselves apart, tell them to come up the mountain. So it's like he actually wants us still to climb the mountain. But he wants us to be ready to encounter him when we get there. And so, uh, we, you know, he doesn't want us to be defeated by it. He wants us to be challenged by it. And he wants us to shed our junk as we climb. Amen? And when we meet him there on a the mountaintop, it's all about him. If we keep looking up, you face this mountain, you prepare yourself like, you know what? This is just a mountain. He's the king. I'm going to go to him. And so just keep looking there. 
And so when it's only about him, but the God of this world, the enemy wants us to think that everything is about who? Us. So where, where are we looking? If we're looking at us, then we're looking at weakness and we're looking down. It's like, man, this is high. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall. This is crazy. I got stuck on the top of a mountain in Utah one time, a big sand mountain trying to rescue a kid. And I got up there okay. She's laughing. <laughs> She's watching from way in the distance. And it's crazy high. And I, I got up there and I looked down like, oh, no. <laughs> it's like, I have no idea how to get down this thing. Yeah, because it's just, it's sand. It's just one of those big sand domes things out there. Like, it was, I'm praying and hanging on and trying to bring the kid down. And, yeah, it was, going up was just part of the journey. I met the challenge at the top of the mountain. But that's what God wants us to do when we're going up a mountain. I don't remember praying going up that mountain. <laughs> I remember praying a lot once I got to the top and looked where I was and what, you know. So, it's a time to... You know, what's interesting, you know, the, the enemy's going to throw all kind of stuff at you. You can't do this and all. But the, the mountains are there to teach us about God and to prepare us for the journey and to prepare us for the next journey. Israel's at Mount Sinai for two years. There for two years. Okay. And what did they learn? They learned about holiness. They didn't know anything about holiness. They've been in Egypt. It's been this crazy pagan place like the world. They don't know anything about that. They don't know anything about the holiness of God. In Egypt, it's just the worldly gods. There, it's just about power. You know, maybe the thunder god and whatever, whatever. The rain god and whatever. Like, holiness, what is that? They never heard of that, being set apart. And so, they weren't ready for their journey into the world and the journey into the promised land until they learned about holiness. They had to encounter God. But... In Deuteronomy 1.16, I like this verse. Yahweh spoke to Yahweh our God spoke to us in Horeb saying, You have lived long enough at this mountain. You have come here and you've lived here. It's like, okay, now turn and take your journey. And he says, you know, and he describes the land. It's a huge piece of land. It's like, I've said it before you. Like, go get it. Go and possess the land. After they had been at that mountain and encountered God and prepared themselves and heard his voice and heard all that, then they're ready to start their real journey. They thought this was their journey. When I'm climbing my mountain, I thought that's the journey. When I'm going up to get the kid, I thought that was a journey. Little did I know, coming back down was the real journey. You know? But you got to do the first part first before you see the second part. It said, going to possess the land. You know, the land I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to give to their offspring after you, after them. How does that? It's like, yeah, but that's like, no, no, no. That's for us. Galatians 3. If you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs to the promise. That very promise. You know, this land that he describes, and, and Israel has, has never occupied what God describes. He's describing what's going to come in the future. They've had pieces of it. They've had big chunks of it. But they've never had the whole thing. You know, Israel's kind of, well, Israel's like, their picture of their, their being in Egypt is really a picture of us being in the world today. We can't, be, we can't overcome it on our own. We're in it. Israel was stuck in Egypt. They're stuck in the world praying and not really having a whole bunch of hope. And then God shows up. Here's what he says. When he first shows up, he comes up to him and he's talking to Moses and he said, God spoke to Moshe and he says, I am Yahweh. Do you know that's a command? Know me. I'm not the gods of Egypt. I'm not the gods of the world. I'm not the flesh. I'm not the computer. I'm not the internet. I am Yahweh. I'm different than anything you have ever seen or that you know. You don't even know what power, authority, holiness is. He said, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I established my covenant with them, the land covenant. I'm, you know, I'm going to bring, I'm going to give you this land. It's coming. Therefore, Exodus 6, <clears throat> tell the children of Israel, I am Yahweh. And then he makes this promise. He says, Moses, go tell them this. I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of Egyptians. I will rid you of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments, and I will take you to me for people. 
and I'll bring you into the land that I gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'll give it to you as a heritage. Marasha, inheritance. It's like, it's yours whether you're there or not. You know, God has blessings for us that are like that. They're, they're Marasha. They're, they're there. They're ours. He's waiting. It's like, yeah, you're not in the land yet. You did some silly stuff that got you kicked out of the land. But it's still there. And it's still yours. And it still has your name on it. So we have this inheritance. We don't always walk in it. Sometimes we go in the wilderness, we go off the path and whatever, but God still has our inheritance and he's waiting to give it to us. Exodus 19, this, today's Torah portion, it says, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. What were they doing? They're running. They're like, are like we're going to inherit the land. No, they're running from Pharaoh. Let's just be honest. They are scared, right? They're running away from Egypt, not really thinking about where they're going. They're just running in fear. We do that sometimes, okay? And finally, they run down this path, and they go down to the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. It's a straight-up dead end. There's nowhere to go. You get there, that's it. You ever been there? Go down there. You're running around, especially in your dreams, but it happens in real life, too. And you go down this tunnel, and you just, boom, you're there, and there's, you, it's a dead end. And you can do absolutely nothing, Okay? And you panic, you cry to God, and, and then this voice says to them, Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the Yeshua of Yahweh, which he will work to you. Stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. It's usually translated. I love what it says. Stand still and see the Yeshua of Yahweh. Yeah. Literally what it says. Okay? Um, you're not going to see the Egyptians again. The thing you're like so scared of, you're not even going to ever see them again after today. You realize they can't even imagine any of this. They're like, yeah, because we're going to be dead. <laughs> you know, probably. You know. But then he says, Yahweh will fight for you and you will stand still. Okay? So they think, okay, that, okay well, good. We'll just, that's because that's what we are used to. You know, we don't want to do anything. Then he says something really interesting. Um, they start, yeah, but we're going to do it. They're still crying. And he says, the sea hasn't parted. This is right after he says this. This is the next verse. Yahweh will fight for you. Okay. Why are you crying to me? Like, Excuse me? I thought you said you were going to handle this. Why are you crying to me? Do something. I'm not living your life. You are. I'm paraphrasing. That's like really paraphrasing. But it's saying take a step. That's what he says. Take a step. He said, why are you crying to me? Go. But there's an ocean there. And it wasn't until somebody took a step that it parted. Okay. It's really, really interesting. And I keep flashing back to Yeshua when he does his first miracle. Okay. He's in Cana. And they've got these pictures of water. And they come to him. It's like, hey, we're out of wine. He said, what's that got to do with me? But, but, but. Take, dip some of that water there. Fill them, fill them all the way full. I'll run them over. Dip some of that and take it to the master of the feast. And, it, and what does his mom say? Whatever he says, just do it. <laughs> okay. Just do it. And, like, and they take it and gave it to the master of the feast. And he's, wow. This is the best. You saved the best till the end. When did the water become wine? What if they'd have just looked in there? It didn't say that they took wine, did it? It didn't. It didn't say that he turned it in. All of the titles in your Bible says Jesus turns water into wine, right? But it doesn't say that. It says he takes some of that, dip it out, the water you just put in there, and take it to the master of the feast. They didn't say it was wine, just to take it to him. Be obedient. Trust me. It's basically what he says at... at when they're standing at the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. He says, why are you crying to me? Go forward. Go. In Judaism, there's a, uh, there's a joke about that because the leader of the Jewish tribe is, was a guy named Nakshan. And, um, you know, the, the, the joke is, it's like uh, Israel crossed the Red Sea and, on the dry land, but Nakshan had dry feet because he was always out front. He was like, let's go. He was already in the water. But that's where we got to be. 
Obviously, he wasn't, or God wouldn't have said, go forward. Why are you crying to me? Go forward. Take a step, right? And so, and I picked this out of all the 20 verses that I looked up. And, and what do we do when we take a step? It's a step of faith. What do they do when they dip the pitcher of water? And they're like, okay, we'll take it to him. <laughs> you know, and he's like, wow. But they're going, wow. <laughs> I bet everybody's going, wow. But we had to take the step. Proverbs 3, 6. Three, six. And all thy ways acknowledge him. Step A. Your God, I'm not. You can do this, I can't. Your word says, so I will. That's acknowledging him. And he will direct your paths. It doesn't say he will direct your path so you can acknowledge him or wait till he sets. It. Just go, would you? Um, so God promised Israel, you know, what he was going to do. I just read you. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. They already knew what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to do this. Did Israel believe it? I don't know. They got to the water and like, oh, uh, doesn't sound like they believed it, does it? So he's already promised them. But in the moment they're challenged, all of a sudden they're frozen. They're afraid. They're not move you know they're not moving you know he says stand still and see the Yeshua of Yahweh stand still was not the command what were they doing it wasn't for them to mean stand and wait till he parts to see what were they doing they were crying we're going to be killed the bad guy's going to eat us right stand still S-T-O-P second word I-T stop it that's what he was saying. Stand still. Stop it. Okay? Stop. Stand still. Stop shaking. Stop running. Stop and look. Stand still and see. That's the command. Stand still and look at what I'm doing. Okay? And move forward. Get out of your fear. Watch for the promise of God. What is he going to do? He's already told us. He's already told them what he's going to do. It's just like he's told you. He's told me. So we need to stop shaking and look. No way out, right? In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Nothing happens until we go forward, until we take that step, okay? So get out of our fear, right? And so when we take that step, what is that? It's trusting God. It's trusting God. Why are you crying to me? He literally says, why are you crying to me? Tell them to go forward. Go but, no, but, go. Take the water, take, take that to the master of the feast. Okay. <laughs> and uh, like I say, I, I found 20 verses about him. These were the words it used. It said, they, over and over, it's like, he will guide you. He will establish your steps. He will make straight your way. Telling you this is the way. He leads us. He shows us the way. When we take a step not about sitting. Yahweh leads the chosen, not the frozen. Amen? <laughs> Exodus, yeah, you got that one. Anyway. Moses goes up to God in Exodus 19, and he says, uh, this is what you tell. Yahweh says, this is what you shall tell the house of Jacob and the children of Israel. And I threw that in there. Because we know that later on it talks about a mixed multitude. It's talking about the two houses of Israel there. And we know there's, they're grafted in. You know? We know that um, Joseph's sons are, you know, they've been grafted in. They're half Egyptian. Okay? And so the whole concept of being grafted in is not new. It's not New Testament. It's Torah. It's right here. Okay? And so Moshe encounters God. And, and he reminds him what all he's done. Uh, he tells Israel everything that he's done, getting them out of Egypt. And what, what is going to, what is he going to require Israel to do? Just believe him and follow him through the path that he has provided. Um, even though that's kind of scary sometimes. He says, Verse 4, he said, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle wings and I brought you to myself. I have done everything I said I would do. You're saved from Egypt. You're out of the world. You're away from the enemy. And now what? I have, you, we have seen the salvation of Yahweh. We've seen the Yeshua of Yahweh. Now what? Would you like to walk in blessings? Would you like to be a holy people? A light unto the nations? Tell you what. 
Verse 5, now then, if indeed you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own special possession among the people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I think Mount Sinai is showing us that God keeps his promises, amen, but he wants more for us. And he wants more for the whole world. And it's interesting that this is not just about Israel. This is not just about keeping the promise to Abraham. Exodus 14, 18 says, I'm doing all this so that the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord. They've got all these foreign gods. They think that's the master. They think that's who they worship. And he's like, uh-uh. Exodus 8, 10. Moses is talking to Pharaoh. And he's like, okay, make the frogs go away. Make the frogs go away. He said, all right, Pharaoh, you tell me when you want the frogs to go away because I'm going to show you who is God. Pharaoh says, tomorrow, Moshe replies, be it according to your word that you may know, Pharaoh, that there is no one like Yahweh our God. He, he wants Pharaoh to know. He wants Egypt to know. He wants the world to know. Israel is called to be a light and especially in today's world. We'd look at the news and all the drama going on in the world. We'd go, how do you be a light? Honestly, it's a piece of cake in a really dark world. You know, you've been in a really dark place and you just light up anything. And it's like, you don't even have to have a whole bunch of light to be a light. So it's actually really easy. Okay? You know, this little light of mine, you remember that song? Y'all probably don't. I'm going to let it shine. Psalm 105 Starts out, it says, give thanks to Yahweh, call on his name, make his doings known among the people. That's a, that's a command. Yahweh said to Moses, go to the people and tell them to get ready, for he's going to speak to you. And be ready on the third day. On the third day, Yahweh's going to come, Yahweh's going to come in the midst of the people on Mount Sinai. He's, they're always moving. Go, 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 go. God's people are always moving. They're always getting prepared. They're always cleansing themselves. They're always getting to know him. And they're always making him known. Okay? And when we do, he shows up. That's what happens. He shows up. Exodus 19, 18. All of Mount Sinai smoked because Yahweh descended on it in fire. And the smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked. And God spoke saying... I am Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You could translate that today. I am Yahweh who brought you out of Mitraim, the misery of the world. Same word, Egypt and Mitraim. Okay. Who brought you out of the misery of the world, out of the addiction, out of the bondage, out of whatever it was. He brought you out. And what's the command? I'm Yahweh. Know me. And make me known. And then the last thing Yeshua says is go into all the nations, all the world, and make disciples, make me known. So here's your challenge. Did you make him known this week? Guess what? You get, you get, I, you're here, so I know you get a new chance. How about next week? Who can you tell? I mean, it, again, it's a really dark world. Y'all know that. People need hope. People just need to know there is hope. Just to know there is hope. And we, get, we have the hope. They don't have to like go crazy today. They just need to hear that there's some hope. Right? And so that's the message we need to share with them. How scary is it to run down a tunnel and find yourself standing at a sea you can't cross? You're not going to do this by yourself either. You're going to pray. Say, Lord, give me somebody to witness to today. Give me somebody that that, you know, I can bring and make a disciple, okay? Pick somebody. A, I'm going to just pray right now. Father, I just pray right now that you, everybody here, you have somebody lined up for them in their life. I just pray you just put that person in their mind right now. They don't have to convert them. They don't have to baptize them. They just need some hope. And, Lord, you are the hope. You are the one that we can stare at the mountain that's before us and say, <laughs> It's just a mountain. I know who made it. Father, there's no mountain we can't encounter that you've set before us as a challenge. 
And Father, there's people out there that need this word, need this truth, and need hope in this dark world. And I just pray you will bring somebody to mind to everybody here today. And also that your spirit will give them the courage to be able to speak to that, be able to speak to that person and encourage them. And just say, if nothing else, in God there's hope. And just go from there. All things are possible for him who believes. Father, I just pray that you empower us and lead us to make your disciples. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Any thoughts about the whole Torah portion or that? Oh, I see that means. Somebody said it's really hot in here. No, I didn't say that. Um, Les, go ahead. Yep. Right. Yahweh enters the world, he wants to be cleansed, I suppose. Uh Is that right? Yep. Well, I think that... um, it's, it's kind of interesting you brought that up because, you know, the first time people read that John the Baptist talks about, it's like, I'm baptizing you with water, but the one comes after me, he will da- baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Or, or pray, how about when Yeshua says, pray for your enemies and it'll, it'll heap coals of fire on their head. Um, be like, yeah, I'm that tired of him burning his hair off, you know, whatever. <laughs> but it means exactly what you're saying. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit and it's cleansing. It burns away. And and they're thinking in terms of a refiner's fire, you know. So, um, burn away the bad. So, yes. Um, So. Yeah, I was thinking about what you were saying about going, uh, sharing, Uh um, and being a light. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, the world is needing to see a light. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, somehow, sometimes we get into our head that means we have to, we have to make an effort to go somewhere and 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 talk about Jesus or whatever, uh-huh. which is good. Yeah. But I got to thinking what I had found years ago when I first found mm-hmm. Torah, that if I just do what God has me to do mm-hmm. in Torah, keep the feasts. Mm-hmm do the things in there that Mm -hmm. he says, Mm -hmm. that alone is the light. And others will see it. Wayne said that, you know, that, that, you know, we had gone to a seven day Adventist church keeping Mm -hmm. the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Well, it was very customary. Mm -hmm. Everybody eats Mm -hmm. on Sabbath. I mean, we go eat. We sat there and we didn't eat because it was day of atonement. Mm -hmm. That spoke to him. It was not only that we were keeping Day of Atonement, but that we were not doing right, the thing, right. you know, the other thing. So b- both of those combined. So I just see doing and and being consistent in doing the things that God has for us to do can also be a light and speak to others around us. For sure. Um, and there's a common, there's actually a common phrase out there that um, your life may be the only um, Bible that somebody ever reads. Um, that's actually not a quote. It's not even close. Um, believe it or not, there are multiple commands to actually witness, you know, over and over and be my witnesses. I mean, over and over and over. But yeah, so I mean, but basically what I'm saying, where I'm going with that, is you, in other words, doing what we do has already prompted them. They already see you keeping Sabbath. They already see you doing these things. They already see you and say, um, don't put the bacon on my BLT. It's going to be a LT. Go ahead, go ahead, man. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, um, you know, put some cheese on it or something. Be ultra, ultra light, ultra LT. Go ahead. Um, about two weeks ago, I... 
I, I, when I woke up, man, it was right, it's right before I was, I was waking up, but I had, I had this, this vision and mm -hmm. it was pure black, back blackness. Mm -hmm. And there was God, um, it was like a big fireball and surrounding it. So up against, again, against this big blackness, there was this bright orange fireball. And, and then there was like a rotation around that, which represented God's ways. And I could okay. see this stream going towards Israel, which was lit up. Uh -huh. And it, and it was just a real beautiful imagery that, because a lot of people think, well, this is the, the Jewish ways, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but no, this is God's ways mm -hmm. that he established. And in, and in that vision, I saw Israel was like sputtering and sometimes there was little tufts of flames yeah. but not going out to the other nations. Um, but again, God, God, he wants us to follow his ways. And Christy, kind of like what, what you shared about the feast, uh, it's just, for me, this has been so powerful to see how God established these feasts. But even when you look at like, you know, the Israelites left, that they had, you know, the, there was the time to leave Egypt. And you could say that that was the first month. So that really at Passover, it was like the first Passover. And it says then this is in the third month. So if you kind of do the numbers, this could very well have been Shavuot, where it's all about, we know in the New Testament, fire, you know, in mm -hmm. the temple. Well, here's fire in the mountains. So it's like mm -hmm. God has just kept this pattern. I know Wayne likes patterns mm -hmm. and it's a, it's just a beautiful pattern that, that we can, we can see here. Just again, how, how powerful uh, the almighty is. It's interesting you, you mentioned that because I was looking up a verse here in Zach's chapter one, verse eight. Um, and because what happens is the early believers, like with John's baptism, they were just told to repent. And I, I think that that's kind of what we have gotten back to as a people. We focus on self and focus on repenting. But the promise there is that, that when you do, you will receive the Holy Spirit. You will receive the Ruach. And um, it reads, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, and you know, so that's, that's, um, that's connected directly to the promise of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit empowers us. He's like, well, I can't do that. Oh, I know you can't do it. I can't either. <laughs> That's not the goal. The, but the Ruach will. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh. It's like, so it's not going to be what we do. It's going to be what he does through us. That's why I like closing the prayer with thank you for what you're doing to us so that you can work through us. And that process is so he can work through us. Um, and there's quite a few of those. But that one's like really strong for me because... Um, if we tried to restrict that passage, well, that just works for some people, then you have to plug, well, then the Holy Spirit's just for some people. Because they actually got along just fine without it up to that point. But it was time, you know, for this message to go to the whole world. Um, yeah, go ahead, Wayne. And, and Richard. I have found the more that I obey his commands and principles and precepts mm -hmm. the more I'm able to have divine appointments mm -hmm. but it's when I struggle against the yoke that he puts before me which is his Torah when I struggle against that yoke I'm out of sync for any other witness right 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 and and yeah so but he's got somebody and I just did he, did he bring somebody to mind when I prayed that prayer, don't forget who it is. Don't forget who it is. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you always do this to me. You get my mind working about 100 miles an hour in about 15 different directions. It's catching then, because that's what uh, mine does all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I shouldn't have said that. Remember a couple of Sabbaths back, you were talking about fishermen yeah. and then uh, hunters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm um, listening to everything being said now and, and, and 
how loving is a God that he puts it on the heart of someone to witness to someone now as a fisherman? Right. Because there will come a time the hunters are coming. when the two witnesses will stand there for 1,300 days and they mm -hmm. will speak every truth of God mm -hmm. and the world will have to listen. They will have power. They mm -hmm. will not bring rain. They will right. destroy people who try to stop them, but they're going to speak everything. So nobody, nobody can say they mm -hmm. did not know the truth of God. Uh, what a blessing it would be to someone to not have to be one of those guys. Right, right. That right. have to, have to face that. take it and hear it then. Right, right. And then there is no, because they're going to kill those two witnesses. Yeah. And, you know, you know it's, it's, it's not going to be a good time. Right, right. But uh, to sure. save somebody from <clears throat> that. You know what's interesting about that? And I mentioned a couple of days ago, and I think I've mentioned a couple of times, that in our generations, in the previous generations, you back up to 1800s and all the way back to 1800. I haven't, I know before that was going on, you know, right on back, but um, I've tracked them from like early 1800 forward. And there was always these powerful evangelists who would basically speak to the known world and travel around the world and, and, and you know, and speak these powerful messages, you know, Dwight Moody and, um, I don't know, Billy Sunday and, uh, you know, and, and of course, um, Billy Graham, you know, from right here, but not just thousands of people, millions of people heard, heard the message. And I've met people who like, I thought, where'd you get sick? Oh, it was actually the Billy Graham crusade, you know? And um, so one of my neighbors. And so they were powerfully effective. And all of a sudden, there's none. And then honestly, when you look at these supposedly powerful evangelists on television, you go, oh my gosh, they're not even speaking truth. And I mean, even their own congregations know they're not speaking truth. Their own denominations are disowning them for what they're saying. It's like we have moved into a time of n not truth, okay? And so, which is, if you think about it, what would prepare the way for truth to really stand out? Just like I was saying, when, when it's in a time of really darkness, you don't need a lot of light. We don't have to have a lot of light right now because there's a lot of darkness, a lot of confusion. And you can just show somebody, hey, look at this. This, this is interesting what this says. What do you think about that? And by the way, um, I've got um, you know, a couple of ways you can evangelize. I, I don't know if I put it on there or not, but just to make it really easy. One of the things that, one of the things that just came to me, I haven't done it in years, but it was really effective, was, hey, I was just looking at this. What do you, what do you, think, what do you think that means, that verse? You haven't decided. You're asking for their opinion. What they think it means. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What, what do you think? I don't know. Next day, like, yeah, that was cool. What about this one? <laughs> yeah, it's like, you see where that's going? You, you can do it in a way where you're not challenging, you're, you're not saying, you know, you don't really say, uh, you believe in God? And like, at which point somebody's going to say the devil believes in God. I hope somebody says that. Because that's the truth. We've been, we've kind of grown up, and that's another part of the confusion of the world is just believing in God supposed to be what's doing it. It's not like recognize you're a sinner and turn, repent and turn. That was the message. And go ahead. Can I just testify that, you know, when I first started in this particular position that I'm in, I got so frustrated with people, 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 people. It was people that were failing us, people that were failing our children. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know, just like what you're saying, the Lord put a woman in the office with me. Mm -hmm. Wasn't supposed to be there, just happenstance, just happened to happen. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. And that woman, every single day, it was Lori, fed me the word of God. I would say, blah, 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 blah. And she would say, oh, there's a scripture for that. You know, the heart, of the, hand, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and like a river, he turns it to wherever he needs it to go. And I'm thinking of elected officials and how they're not doing what they should be doing. You know, oh, yeah. I would, all of those things, and then, well, here's the scripture right here for that. Oh, well, here's the scripture. And every single day, little teeny tiny morsels of the word, and that word is so powerful. That's true. So powerful. Yep. And so even if, it, if it's just sharing little teeny tiny tidbits of what his truth is, when it comes to what your issue is, you know, there's a, there's a scripture for that. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just so powerful. And I, I thank the Lord all the time that he, he I know he put that person mm -hmm. there for me 
for her and for me. Yeah, yeah, and so I sure. praise the Lord for that too. Amen. Just how powerful that yeah, is. Yeah, you you don't you don't have to go anywhere. You're already there to meet the person he wants you to meet. Like, you know, um, and I say it's it's like yeah, but you don't know my past. It's like yeah, I do. It's just like everybody else. It's ugly, <laughs> and your shoe is unpaid for it. It's so it's clean. So it's as simple as that. Um, don't let don't let the devil mess with you on that. Um, I was sharing somebody the other day that this this guy that was when I was a, a associate chaplain at um, Latra County. This guy that was just uh, he was a train wreck. I want to say he had a 114 charges at 14 years old. His rap sheet was like I don't even remember how many pages, pages and pages and pages. And uh, and in the class that he was in, they would come to the chapel and just like, what did he do this week? You know, it was just always something crazy. And uh, right before I left, I remember they had him in lockdown and he had told me and like, yeah, he did this and he put him in lockdown and he put his mattress against the door, took his clothes off and he started screaming and cussing and carrying on and, you know, and the goon squad came in and about six guys <laughs> blasted through that door like linebackers and tased him like three times and then his comment was, I, I, I hate to say it, but I kind of like getting tased. It leaves this funny taste in your mouth. <laughs> like, dude, I think it was like shock therapy or something. But um, and I don't know. Did I tell you all? I think it was Wednesday night. I told a story, so part of you didn't hear it. But we went over to Gainesville for a function, and it was uh, um, at Purim. Yeah, it was Purim in downtown, and the uh, Jewish Students Union was doing it. So we did that. And I'm on the way back to the car, this guy, I hear this voice in the dark. Says, hey. Uh, hey, what? Uh, you know. Hey, PJ, is that you, Mr. PJ? Aren't you Mr. PJ? I said, yeah. Who is that? And he starts kind of coming over really fast. And uh, he said, remember me, remember me, remember me? And he's trying, and we go through this long thing trying to remember him. I don't remember him, of course. And I'm trying to figure out how to remember him. I said, who was in there when you were in there? He names people. I don't remember him. And I say, do you remember the kid that used to lock himself in the, you know, in lockdown and like beat on the doors and like getting tased and all? He goes, that's me, that's me, that's me. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. And he goes, I said, so what are you doing? He said, I'm a preacher. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, I, I'm three days a week down here. I preach, uh, preach and I've been, you know, I want to show you some stuff. And he's like, starts pulling out stuff he's written and all. Look at it. Take this, take this, read this, read this. You know, he's got all these little tracks he's written and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, literally like, oh my God, what you can do with the least of the least. I mean, uh, I mean, and I, I had to repent because I thought, that guy's never going to make it. You know, you see people like, they're just never going to make it. There's just nothing we can do. He's the one that's out there evangelizing, for goodness sake. I mean, it was, it was, it, yeah, it checked me about, <laughs> let me show you what I can do. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely don't think you can't do it. I, has anybody in here locked yourself in a cell and uh, got naked and got tased and you liked it? No, okay, all right, just checking. So, you see, you're like way ahead of the game. But anyway. Her advice to me and said, well, this is what the word says. I mean, even when somebody comes to you and says, well, hey, what do you think about this? That's an excellent and point. And she did not give me her advice. She, she pulled you. that Bible right out of her drawer, right, and she's like, right. this is, well, this is what God says. This is what the Word says about that. Yeah. And, and so that was, that was the point I was trying to make. I don't uh -huh. think I, I made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really great. And you, uh, about half the audience panicked when you said that. Like, oh, gosh, I could never do that. Yes, you can. It's called Google. <laughs> Just go to your search engine and say, what does the Bible say about this? Boom. And there's your answer. Great, great question. Uh, all right. Are, are we ready in the back? Are, are we are? Okay, thank you. Any other burning questions? All right. It's an interesting Torah portion. I mean, we could go and just look at the Ten Commandments, which we've done, but I think we need to look at the challenge of what's, how do we approach him you know, when he's ready to do something. I think he's ready to do something. It's like Wayne's saying, like, 
I don't usually say this, but I mean, just there's something weird about there not being an international evangelist who's speaking at least some truth, you know, maybe it's not deep or anything, but it's like, oh my gosh, it's like, it's this void, you know, and then it talks about right before the, um, um, the two witnesses that there's a, a time, a, a dearth of, of the word, there's no word, there's no truth, you know, it's like, that's where the world is right now. Yeah. I mean, even people that used to tell the truth. I just, I just put up an antenna to get to football game, and I don't normally watch it. Well, exactly. And, and, but here's the problem, and I'm going to leave you with this. She said everybody has their own truth, and that's true, because what they will say to you, like, well, that's your truth. Okay, and, and, and that's what the lady did not do to you. You could not turn around and say, well, that's your truth. I because the answer is no, that's God's truth, that is the not truth. my truth. That is the truth. That is the... So, so the point of that is, they'll say, well, there is no truth. Okay, that's just your opinion. Here's the definition. Truth by definition, what's the word I'm looking for? Is, basically, there's a word, I can't think of the word. But it basically means, help me with that. What is the word, Danny? It's like, it means eliminates. It, you can't, everything can't be a part of it. Even though we don't like it, some of the stuff gets pushed out of the way. Exclusive, Exclusive. thank you. Yeah. Exclusive, that's the word. So truth by definition is exclusive. Yeah, but that doesn't include these. You need to include, like, truth by definition is exclusive. Everything can't be true. Only one thing can ultimately be true. But it's true. <laughs> is that true? Yes, it is. <laughs>